One of the texts found at Qumran, uh, found in K4, K4 was discovered in 1952 and had something like 600 documents or more, uh, is an Aramaic text. It's, it's given the number 246, so it is to be called uh, 4Q246. Sometimes it's called uh, an Aramaic apocalypse or son of God text or something like that. All it is is a single piece of leather with two columns, uh, nine lines in, of Aramaic in each column. The first column uh, is a little bit damaged on the edge. And remember, we're going from right to left, so it's on the right side of the leather, and it knocks out a couple of words in a, two or three of the lines. But we can reconstruct it. Joseph Fitzmaier, I think, reconstructed it correctly. And then the second column uh, is perfectly restored. Well, it's just a piece of leather of what had been a larger text. So we call it columns one and two, but originally, who knows what the columns would have been. But man, it, we couldn't have found something more relevant for understanding Luke's Annunciation. And this is unique to Luke, where the angel appears, Gabriel appears to Mary, and tells her that she's going to have a son. And she, she doesn't understand how that can be. She has not yet married Joseph. And he goes on to say, well, it's the Holy Spirit who will overshadow you. And there are four distinct things. <clears throat> there are four distinct things that the angel tells Mary. He tells her her son will be great. He will be called son of God. He will be called son of the most high. And he will reign forever. Four things. Well, those are the four things that we find in these two columns that survive called 4Q246. That's exactly what it is near the bottom of column one and then on into the top of column two. It goes on to describe the interpretation of a dream that we think is a Jewish king has had. He's frightened and then someone, he's not, we're not told who it is, but he's sort of a Daniel-like character tells him that he's going to have a son who will be great. He will be called Son of God. He will be called Son of the Most High. And he will rule forever. Now this text, of course, is debated. It's out of context. We don't know about the material that precedes it. We don't know about the material that follows it. So we don't have a real good context. <clears throat> Some scholars have suggested that, well, maybe this is the Antichrist. David Flusser and a few others have suggested that. Others like John Collins have said, well, no, it's, it really is the Messiah. He's a positive character who's coming. And I'm inclined to that view myself. I think John is right. Joseph Fitzmaier has suggested that, well, we don't know for sure that it's Messianic, but I think he's being pedantic simply because Mashiach or Meshekah, the Aramaic word for Messiah, the Messiah does not occur. But my goodness, you're talking about a Jewish king who has a son who's going to be called son of God. Warfare will cease when he comes. It sure sounds messianic. But here's where it really pays off for understanding. It isn't just these four parallels that we have with uh, Luke 1, 32 to 38. What had, had been going on in German scholarship primarily in the history of religion school beginning in the late 19th century on into the 20th, was the idea that Christian Christology, Messianic ideas, and some of the Jewish ideas before Christianity were heavily influenced by Greco-Roman thinking. And so if you know anything about the cult of the divine emperor, you know he's called son of God. So some of these uh, scholars were arguing that uh, Jesus was never thought of as the Son of God, or even the Jewish Messiah idea was never thought of as a divine Son of God, that this is a later importation. This is a later influence from the Greco-Roman world. So the early church is excited about the resurrection. They're convinced now that Jesus is the Lord's anointed. And so they adopt this Greco-Roman terminology, and they start talking about Jesus as Son of God. Sort of a, you know upgrading the Christology to match what Greeks and Romans were saying about the Roman emperor. You know, you say he's a son of God. Well, our guy's a son of God too. 
But what's interesting here is 4Q246, in my opinion, has settled it in favor of now. This is, this is on Jewish soil, this idea. This text, 4Q246, dates from the first century BC, is using the very language that appears uh, in the Annunciation of Luke 1. And Luke didn't read it. Luke, there's no evidence that Luke could read Hebrew or Aramaic. And so what was thought to be a Greco-Roman terminology turns out to be pre-Christian and right at home in Aramaic-speaking Jewish Palestine. So that this is not some post-Easter idea that the early church adopted so that it could compete with the uh, Roman cult of the divine emperor, but instead it's an idea that's right at home. <clears throat> instead, it's an idea that is right at home in Jewish eschatology. So that's a very interesting uh, contribution that this text makes. It's just a small piece of leather. Uh, it's just two columns of what had been a larger work, and yet it sheds significant light on a very important passage uh, in the Gospel of Luke and in the uh, early church's understanding of Christology and our understanding of where some of these ideas come from.